So we're learning to speak the language of a society that says, don't, don't come at me first with your Bible proofs or theology. Don't start quoting Jesus to me. Here's what I want to know. And it's an old question from John 10 and verse 20. When the disciples were dealing with some unbelieving Jews, at these words the Jews were again divided and many of them said, he's demon-possessed and raving mad. Can you read these four words with me? Why listen? That's what we're answering this morning. Why should a world that may think Jesus is just mad listen to him? Never before has a generation had more access to the truth about Jesus Christ. But never before has there been more skepticism and confusion about Jesus Christ. Isn't that odd? This generation can Google more information about Jesus than Bible professors in past generations could have possibly ever read. Reams and reams and reams and reams, only they don't use reams anymore. They're saving the trees. And it goes on and on. If you sat down at your computer and simply Googled Jesus Christ and history, you would have over 300,000 pages, computer pages, of information. And many of those pages aren't page size like you think of it. Some of the pages would take you an hour or more to begin to plow through. You do not have enough time in your life if you determine to read every blog, every post, every study piece that's written on Jesus Christ out there. Now you say, well, okay, so what? Why is this so? Someone says, you're stupid to believe in Jesus anymore. Time out. Then I need you to tell me, why is it that Jesus is the most written about, painted, sung about, studied about person in all of human history? Now, when you ask that, don't be smart mouth about it, sometimes like I am, all right? Don't like, well, you tell me this then. Sincerely ask. Why do you think that's the case? Because if you are a gentle, respectful, loving questioner, you will get so much deeper into someone's heart and engaging them than if you are wagging a finger. And even from from some of the facts I gave you yesterday, some of you came up, oh, thanks for those. I've got somebody. I can't wait to get back. And I'm thinking, oh, no. You're going to sit them down and say, I tell you what, you will almost never argue someone into the kingdom of God. But you can lovingly ask questions that will guide them as the Holy Spirit works in their heart to say, well, that's a good question. A friend of mine, when he talks to people about God who say, I don't believe God had made the world. Okay. I thought you're a Christian. Well, I know, but you're not, and so you don't think God made the world. That's, you, you've got a right to that opinion. How do you think such a complicated, amazing world got here? I think it was Rubel that I heard one time describe it as walking into the forest and finding a pup tent and a campfire and a Boy Scout set of coffee mugs and a little line with Boy Scout uniforms on it. If you stumble on that in the forest, do you say, wow, a tornado hit a Boy Scout building? (laughs) Or do you assume there's some Boy Scouts around? Because this camp's pretty strong evidence. Because you don't have a set-up pup tent and a fire and a coffee mug and clothes on the line. I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't get into the issues about God because they are so deep and so many. But let me just make sure, even though we're not tackling the question, is it silly to believe in God, there is so much evidence to simply ask the question, how did this happen? But we're on Jesus today. Um, yesterday, I'll mention the Tostito bag just for those who weren't here and don't understand it. If you'll put that to slide the Tostito bag up, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the class will later. All right, slide eight if you would, please. <laughs> It'll make them talk to you. It's a good thing for them. Yaroslav Pelikan, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, 
Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. It is from his birth that most of the human race dates his calendars. It is by his name that millions curse and in his name that millions pray. I was intrigued to find out that Jesus is still one of the most popular curse words among atheists. You just got to ask, don't you? Nobody shouts, Muhammad. They just don't do that. They don't yell, Confucius. But boy, howdy, isn't it interesting how Christ's name, even by those who don't believe in him, slips so quickly off their lips. And sometimes, forgive us, even ours, Lord, when we're upset. So we started with a handful of reasons. You got your hand? Here we go. The first reason we said was, let's just ask the question, if Jesus was God's son, what would we expect to find? One, we would expect to see, and we do see, how Jesus changed. Everybody say history out loud. Stick your thumb up because you'll remember it that way. This is more exercise than some of you. Well, no, you walk down the steps. Never mind. You've got good exercise. Just hold your thumb out and say the word history. History. When you th- see your thumb, think of the kid who likes history class, all right? There's all, two in every school. So here you are, and you say, all right. Hi- Jesus changed history in such an amazing and powerful way. We date our calendars by him. Uh, we talked all about that yesterday. All right, second, we said, remember what this one is? This is education. That's the teacher wagging their finger at you. Education. Jesus changed education. We saw, talked yesterday about the history of our own public education, about Jesus's teaching on teaching and how it was Christ followers. And I had somebody come up and remind me. And I said, Jeff, you you talked about the monks and you talked about those who who were preserving. She, She said, you know, those were Catholics. And I need to say clearly, absolutely. And I apologize if sometimes we use language that may make someone think that someone who believed in Jesus in 12 A.D. or in 13 A.D. or in 16 A.D., was not a believer in Jesus. Now, I, I'm not going to fuss with you about the difference between what I believe the Scripture teaches and, and say what Catholic doctrine is. But let's not for a minute think that people who are willing to spend their lives preserving God's Word and copying God's Word because of one name, Jesus Christ, are not worthy of our respect. Because praise God, we're not the judge. Amen. Yeah, if you're married to somebody, lean over and say, you are not the judge. Go ahead, tell them that. <laughs> because sometimes we get the feeling that we are. Praise God, there is a judge, and he will judge all things in right ways. And praise God, he is a judge who lives and loves in grace. Amen. All right, so we got history, and then we got... Then you make a little C with three fingers, and what does that remind you of? Everybody say, Compassion. Compassion. Compassion has to do, and we'll kind of pick up there is where we left off yesterday. Compassion has to do with the way we look at the value of human life. We talked yesterday about how an early Greek historian said we drown children at birth when they are weak or abnormal. We live in a society in which the disabled are guarded by good laws. We live in a society in which folks who are blind, who are deaf, who are unable to walk, have organizations and groups all around them that say, we want to make sure you are not run over by society. And we believe that's a good and healthy thing. Amen? If you saw a child teasing a disabled child, What would be your response? Yeah. Would you grab them up and want to take them and give them a little bit of the rod of understanding or the hand of encouragement and say, I cannot be... Do you know how wrong that is? Folks, people around you may not know that the only reason you feel that way is because of Jesus Christ. Now, to be fair, Jesus felt that way because of what God has always told his people. Which is, don't you take advantage of the alien. Don't you take advantage of the poor. Don't you take advantage of those that cannot care for themselves. But Jesus says, as you have done for the least of these, you've done to me. 
in Christ's own day, in Roman and Greek culture, disabled people were discarded at birth. I don't say that to shock you. I say that because if you don't know it, then you won't realize how huge it was that when it was the Christians who started the hospitals, a Benedictine monk that began the first actual hospital to care for people out of that Greek word for hospitality. And by the way, do you know what the Greek word for hospitality is? Xenophilia. What's xenophilia? Xeno is the word for stranger. Philia, you should all know from all your classes at church, you know, there's, there's agape and there's eros and there's philia. What is philia? It's one of the words for hospitality. I love this. Greek word, xenophilia, stranger love. A love of those who are not your family. Guess what a hospito is? It is a place where guided and gifted doctors, nurses, the people that put you to sleep. Someone said, no, the proper word is preachers. The people that... These people serve folks who they don't know from Adam and praise God for the fact that they do. Amen? Amen. Do you know why those places exist? Because Jesus' followers said, we will not throw the disabled away and we will not abandon the sick. In the first three centuries of the church, there were a couple of major epidemics that decimated up to a third of the world's population. They were terrible things. Dionysius wrote about one of them. They created such a panic. At the first onset of disease, they pushed the suffering away and fled from their dearest, throwing them out into the road, treating unburied corpses as dirt, hoping to avoid the spread of dread diseases. Now, is that the opposite of the way you think about a sick person? If you lived in that day and someone in your house got one of the plagues, you would, without question, get them out in the street. Because the belief was, well, once that thing starts in your house, somehow the gods are against you and it's just going to spread. I'll tell you a little bit later, they had no clue about germ theory. It was just a matter of fear. So the believers started to go to the house of those who were sick. Now, you say go to the house. You see, if the house starts having more sick people than not, then the well ones would leave and leave them in the house to die. Who began to bring meals to those people? Who began to go to the houses and say, I give you this in the name of Jesus Christ? Who began to find that there were illnesses that killed people, but there were illnesses that if you nursed them, they'd get over it? And so they began to build rooms on, hospitality rooms, onto the churches, onto the places of worship. And Benedict, a monastic leader, began the first hospitals and they came out of the church in the fourth century. Much later, when a multinational effort to care for needy people and hurting people all over the world was being formed through the United Nations, this non-religious body had a challenge to select a symbol for this group that would care for people that they did not know, that would be a compassion group. And after much debate, hear me now, this multinational, non-religious group chose its symbol, the Red Cross. You want to tell me how they ended up choosing a Red Cross? You already know, don't you? Because the cross of Christ is an internationally understood symbol. Now, the bottom of it was shortened some, and there's different legends about, you know, the arguments over that and the concerns about whether a a Muslim person would allow you to help them if it was a big red cross as we see it. But don't make no mistake, nobody calls it the Red Plus organization. (laughs) They call it the Red Cross for a reason. Next time somebody says, it's just dumb to believe in Jesus. Really? Tell me why we have a red cross. 
all over the world. In recent years, to be fair, folks in Muslim countries understood this, and so they now have the red crescent. But that only came about because they knew that links back to Jesus. Pity more of us weren't aware of that. As far as philanthropic influence about people giving and caring, more money has been given to the sick and the needy through churches of Jesus Christ than any other organization. Now you say, wait a minute, what about the Gates and the Buffets who give these b- b- billions of dollars? I'm going to suggest that the reason that the Gates... You say, they're not Christian people. First off, I'm not going to go there. But I'm not going to suggest that the Gates got up one morning and in a vacuum said, you know, it's good to give money to the poor. They have grown up in the water of the culture of the influence of Jesus Christ. And there are many atheists and non-believers who give and do wonderful things. But brothers and sisters, that is because of the influence of the culture of Jesus, I would suggest. Because there are other cultures that sit more outside of the influence of Christ. And in those cultures, when you have an argument with someone, you spear them. Anybody who's seen the other end of the spear or who knows much about the Awani people from uh, down in the uh, jungles of the Amazon understand what I'm talking about. You see, we forget. It's the Tostito bag. We forget that right in the middle of history stands Jesus Christ and his influence is so great, so deep. I love the way Mark Nelson puts this, historian. If you ask what is Jesus' influence on medicine and compassion, if you look across the world, wherever you have an institution of self-giving for the lowly, schools, hospitals, orphanages, for those who will never be able to repay, this probably has its roots in the movement of Jesus. And may his name be praised. Amen. All right, let's get to the fourth one. And for the fourth one, I'm going to ask you to, to kind of put a little pinky down like this, all right? And, and when you put your pinky down like this, I'm hoping that you feel artistic, all right? Okay? Because that's what the fourth one is. That fourth finger is how Jesus impacted the arts in the world, all right? Let's review quickly. This one is, say it out loud. And then, and then, and then very good. What about the arts? Now, some would say that the arts are the place where Jesus has the least influence because the arts are often the most uh, liberal. The arts are often the place where uh, humanist ideas, some would say, are being shoved down our throat. And let me pause and say, there's some great movies that have been released since the Passion of Christ, more and more of them. Um, I'm going to do just a little tiny commercial, all right? And I don't get paid for this. Christian filmmakers are getting better. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of those early, some of those early films, you went and you took your friends, you're so excited, and you went, who oh boy, <laughs> you know. And some of your friends kind of giggled and said, oh, give me a break. All right. We somehow made the decision that the arts belong to the devil. And so we folded our arms and we just talked to one another about Jesus. But then folks like Mel Gibson and others said, wait a minute, The Ten Commandments was a pretty good movie in its day. Why don't we begin to tell the story of Jesus in the language of this culture? Brothers and sisters, we're only going to get better as Christians making movies by making more of them. But here's the problem. Young Christian filmmakers make movies. And we hear a review that says, all the script was terrible. All the acting was awful. I'm going to ask you, on behalf of the future Christian filmmakers, go anyway. Buy a ticket, take a friend. And then have the discussion that, yeah, you know, the script was weak in some parts, and yeah, some of the acting wasn't great, but can we talk about the content? Because the more it happens, the more these young Christian filmmakers and older Christian filmmakers are going to produce better and better films. I guess what I'm saying is, let's give them a hand up. Let's not smack them in the face because they're not all of a sudden Steven Spielberg. Can I get an oh yeah on that? Okay, all right, thank you. I appreciate that. Having said all that, 
My wife and I traveled to Europe a few years back on a sabbatical. And my wife is the artsy one in our family when it comes to real art. She made sure that she drug, pardon me, that she took me <laughs> to the Louvre, that she took me to a museum in, um, in Barcelona, which was amazing. It is very famous, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was wonderful. <laughs> we went to museums in England. We went to museums with portrait after portrait, large ones, small ones. Yes, we stood in line to see the lady with just half a smile and all of those great pictures. What I don't know that I would have noticed had I not already read some of this research is that if you put a huge magnet above any of the great museums in the world and punched a button and made it pull up every piece of painted or sculpted art that was in any way influenced by Jesus Christ. Any that had his image in it, any that had a cross in it, any that had a church cathedral in it, any of the many, many images of Mary or of the disciples or of biblical scenes, any of the images that had to do with the bishops or the cardinals, if you yanked all of the Jesus-influenced art out of those museums, one writer said that many of them would lose up to three-fourths of their great art. Why? Because Jesus has influenced art more than any human to ever walk the planet. I think it's a pretty unarguable thing. Now, I had somebody come and say, yes, but there's more and more modern art that has nothing to do with Jesus, and that's totally fair. And one would expect that there would be a growing number of pictures, portraits, paintings, and goodness, if you count all the things that are on the net, so that's why I'm sticking with museums at this point, because we put museums together to house what we might call great art, art that has been truly recognized to be influential. But let's go beyond what hangs on the wall. Without Jesus, there would be no St. Peter's, no St. Paul's, no Notre Dame. You would empty nearly many museums and you think about one man whose influence touched people and sparked them to build buildings they would never see finished. Wrap your head around that one. Because we're a generation that doesn't do anything if we can't get her done. We're the first generation to stand in front of microwaves and say, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. (laughs) But if someone said, we're going to build this building and we'd like you to help us to carve the stones for the foundation of it and I want you to realize you'll never see it finished. We'd say, you're crazy. Why would you even ask me to do something like that? And yet generation after generation built giant cathedrals through the centuries. Why? Jesus Christ. Why should I believe in Jesus? When it comes to the written word, wow, can you imagine losing Dante's Divine Comedy, which influenced almost subsequent Italian literature, or Luther's German Bible, which shaped the German language, or the King James Bible, which along with Shakespeare shaped the English language. From Pilgrim's Progress to the Shack, the pages written about Jesus are more pages in history about any single person, including Elvis, Hitler, and Lincoln combined. They don't even come close. Praise God that Jesus so impacted our world that people just couldn't stop writing about him. And when someone says, well, it's silly to believe that Jesus is the Christ, I just stop and ask, then explain all this, will you? Great right-wing conspiracy just won't fly for the explanation of why Jesus continues to spark the creative hearts of men. And music? Oh, my goodness. Think of the countless pieces of great music that shape the way we think about music. Handel's Hallelujah Chorus, Bach's Ode to Joy, Mozart's Requiem, Justin Bieber's Christmas album. I mean, over and over and over again. I'll even give you this one. Did you know modern music notation, the little dots with which we read music, came about from the followers of Jesus who were in monasteries finding a way to sing together and share the praises of Christ? That's where it came from. Next time you open a hymnal, realize it was Jesus' people who came up with that system. And yet people say, well, you know, the arts community doesn't have much interest in Jesus. They don't understand they're swimming in his influence. Sculpture, drama, poetry. Jesus has inspired more amazing, lasting, global art than anyone. And if you came here from another planet and just looked at the historical evidence of art through the ages, the first question you'd ask after that review is, Who is Jesus? (laughs) 
because your data would tell you he is not like everyone else. And the whole church said? Amen. All right. Open your hand. Reach down. And I want you to lift up somebody and I want to talk about human rights and dignity. Here we go. <sighs> Slavery. Prejudice. Cruelty to people whose views or whose skin color is different from yours is something that every person in this room grew up assuming anybody with any sense knows that's the right way to live. Do you realize that one of the first egalitarian statements ever come from, early anyway, come from here there is no Greek or Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, Colossians 3, 9 through 11, but in Christ... We are all together. We are all one in Christ. Christ is all and in all. Okay, now, that's a scripture you've read, you've quoted. Some of you earned a VBS pencil by memorizing that verse, right? Junior Greek, bond to free. He says, let me tell you. The historian taps me on the shoulder and says, do you realize what an unbelievable, shocking statement that was in that day? In a day in which you were not allowed to own property if you were of a certain sex, and you certainly were not allowed to own things or be respected, people say, no, in America we say, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created. Yeah, really, self-evident. Attila the Hun did not consider those truths to be self-evident. Genghis Khan did not consider those truths to be self-evident. Slaves traders in Europe and in America did not seem to consider those truths to be self-evident. But Jesus did. And Jesus was willing to teach about the good Samaritan when others would sneer. And Jesus' people through the years have been the ones that have marched and have protested and have said abolition will happen. That was led by Christians. Women's rights were led by believers. Children's rights were championed by Christians. And that's why preachers and Jesus followers were at the head of most of the civil rights parades. The government did not sit up and say, we've got to treat African Americans better. It was Christians. It was believers in Jesus. That's where you found your Martin Luther Kings. That's where you found those folks that marched in Birmingham. That's where you found the one that were getting on those buses. And you may think, oh, well, that was, you know, the academia. Let me tell you who was at the forefront of it. People who said, I'll tell you why all men are created equal, because we are God's children. And because my Jesus taught me so. And when Martin Luther King departed from his script, on that famous day standing in front of the Lincoln statue. And by the way, if you have not done so, go to the Lincoln Memorial and turn right from his statue and read the engraved words on the wall where Lincoln speaks of his faith and of God and of how the Lord influenced him. We have a nation whose very ethos was driven by the teachings of Jesus. Silly to believe in Christ? You're swimming in his influence. When Martin Luther stood there and began to say, let justice roll like a river, guess whose vision he was talking about? I have a dream. Mahalia Jackson, if you listen, you can hear her. Call out from the chorus. Tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And Martin begins to give this vision of a colorblind world where it is not your skin, but the quality of your character. Do you know whose dream he was speaking? Jesus Christ who said, suffer the little ones and let them come unto me. Jesus Christ, whose followers taught and wrote, there is no Jew nor Greek nor bond nor free nor male nor female. Jesus Christ, who when the Samaritan woman, who when the woman with the blood problem that made her pariah in society came to him, Jesus 
was already the greatest civil rights leader in the world. And through his influence, we have the freedoms and the blessings in this country and through the influence of believers ever since that. Tomorrow we're going to deal with why I believe it's not stupid to believe in the Bible and why I believe it is not in any way stupid to believe in the church. You know, God's Word points us in a direction and evidence points us in a direction. But the greatest power is when people truly turn their lives over to Jesus.